my name is uh, Jose Ramon Tizon Viveri. I am the Executive Director of the Manila Observatory. My name is Joanna Vasquez Arong, and I'm a filmmaker based out of Manila. And the name of my film is Pagpakalma sa Unos, To Calm the Pig Inside. I'm Daryl Delgado. I'm a writer from the Philippines. And I wrote the book um, Remains. Well, it's different. It's not the usual four seasons, right? Uh, but we share our climate with countries in the tropics. Uh, and that's why we, we use the word monsoon to describe our climate. Monsoon is a it's an old Arabic word. It comes from a, that word, mal malsim, which means a uh, period, a time of year, mm -hmm. the right time to make a voyage or make a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And so even, even then, we were already seeing these patterns of that there would be a change in the wind. In, in the Philippines, we have these two, two wind regimes. We call them habagat. Habagat is a local term, which means a southwest monsoon. Wind is coming from the southwest, which brings the warm air and the rain, usually from April to October. And then the dry, cold winds from the north, amihan, which uh, I guess comes from the, I don't know where amihan, the word amihan comes from. Uh, it brings in the cold winds from November to around April. And sometimes we were taught in grade school that our climate is just wet and dry, but it's more than just wet and dry. There's wet and wetter in some regions. Uh, uh, so, and it, it hits us, the wetness or dryness hits us at different times of the year. So it's quite rich. Uh, Sometimes people will say it's boring because it's the same old, same old, meaning you know, the weather tomorrow will probably be the same as the weather today. There are dramatic changes. I think, for example, hurricanes or typhoons can be those dramatic instances when there is a disruption to the usual patterns. If you've never seen a typhoon, which is, uh, can be a, a large scale tornado, Right? But the Philippines is the place to go if you are fascinated by uh, these forces of nature where, where you see winds just picking up speed in the range of what, 200 to 300 kilometers per hour. Mm -hmm. I think that's sometimes inconceivable. How do you experience a 300 kilometer per hour wind as like Typhoon Yolanda? This is one of the most vulnerable countries. We identify with the small island developing states in Micronesia or in other parts of the Pacific and Atlantic. Right? Uh, we're, we're big. Actually, we're not small. But we are right there, actually, in the path of, of extreme weather and uh, extreme sea level events. So it is some, something that we need to worry about, actually. Uh, we talk about sea level. Sea level rise. And sea levels are actually rising the fastest in our part of the world. Temperatures are rising fastest poles, like the North Pole. But when it comes to sea level, the ice melting and the seas, oceans are warming. I think we will have to uh, take care that this does not affect our own fisheries, our own coral reefs which actually have sustained us for centuries. In Bahanes, the house of that kind, is made of 50 tons of limestone and 8,000 weeds and all sorts of grass. I've never been to Bahanes myself. <laughs> the people there have adapted. They know, they know, what, a, they know what a strong wind is. The point of, of the story of the house of that kind like this, you cannot build it alone. It's built by the community. 
in, the, in fact, they have a term for it, it's a new one. It's just like our Bayani, uh, which is really the community spirit. It is the community that builds the house for you. So we have that also in our culture. And I hope we can tap that, that spirit. You know, I've given talks in the last few weeks about the, la the, la the latest report. And it's, it's really worrisome. Um, and, but I don't want to be, I do not want to depress, especially the young ones, because it can be, I don't know, it can be depressing. Uh, but we, what this report, this latest report tells us is that we still have time. We still have time to change things. We can avert a, a three degree world. That's one thing we're trying to avoid. If, if we don't do things, if we just, just go about our lives uh, the way we've been uh, doing so the last few decades. We probably yeah, reach three degrees, you know, two point seven to three degrees. That will be catastrophic. So we have this short runway of about ten years, you know, down to ten to thirty, to turn things around. And it's there. I think things are turning around. You want to change people. We look through stories. Stories we tell each other. It's stories that uh, try to draw meaning or make meaning out of our experience. You know, originally I hadn't intended of making a film on Yolanda. Um, but what had happened was I spent so much time there um, initially uh, for another film. It was an international film and I was their local producer and I was spending so much time there soon after the typhoon hit. But before even working with this production team, um, you know, the typhoon was supposed to hit through Cebu and it kind of bypassed. Through, well, it hit Cebu in the north, but it really hit, of course, Tacloban and Giwan. Um, so even though I was far from it. I was coordinating with so many friends from Cebu, trying to get help out to wherever. So I was quite close to it. And then when I got this job as a local producer, going to the places, looking for places for us to stay, you know, you just you just were exposed to the, the trauma that everybody was going through. And eventually, I started a scholarship initiative. And um, this is how I started meeting more students, more teachers, and hearing everybody's stories. And my partners were um, the Rotary Club. And the more I heard their stories, you know, them recounting everything. Of course, when we had to interview our students, for example, mm -hmm. um, I could see in their eyes that they were still traumatized months later. So I just asked them, you know, um, you don't have to tell me anything. Do you, you, would you mind drawing um, your experience, maybe? Because, you know, we had to choose our students. And in the end, so the, 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 the illustrations that you actually see in the film were from our scholars. When I heard all their stories, eventually I decided to make a film based on their stories. From my experience with my film, um, having traveled to a lot of different festivals, I was actually only at one festival physically and spoke to a lot of people then. But of course, I've spoken to other people virtually all over the world. And... At my first festival, I was really surprised because people came to me and told me, for example, there was one guy from London mm -hmm. saying, I didn't realize there were these typhoons in the Philippines. Or, and, and then there was another person from, from the Bahamas that said, this is exactly what's happening to us. And, and the, corrupt, not the, cor the corruption or how the government deals with it, it's, it's the same. And I want, also want to make the same kind of film. So I, I imagine the same would be to get the message across. It's really to get the personal stories across. It's basically storytelling at, at the crux. So maybe in that sense, that's what it really has in common. And, and I think what I tried to incorporate with the film is just intertwining the, this human experience of people. And, you know, at the end of the day, it was really, I think my film is really, yes, you talk about climate fiction, but it was also about trauma, really trauma that was um, imposed because of the devastation of the climate. Um, so in a way it was how do people deal with trauma, both personal and collective. 
as a writer, um, I, I, I guess, like many writers, I pay attention to the details. And I, I think it comes naturally to anyone who writes or anyone who reads for, for that matter. Um, that, you know, it, it may seem to other people like it's, it's a season, there's a pattern, there's a rhythm, it's, it's natural. But if you're a writer, I think you tend to pay attention to what that does to people, to people's way of life, to, to the place. I grew up um, specifically in Eastern Visayas, the, the typhoon belt, the typhoon capital of the world. I grew up in Tacuaban City, which is surrounded by, by water. My the my interaction with weather might be very different from someone who grew up say in the northern part of the country or in the south and because we are in the central part of the philippines and you know the the, the island opens up to to the pacific um the weather can be very extreme extremely beautiful and bright you know i remember uh, growing up you know, with many 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 beautiful memories and always you know, the memories are tied to what the weather was like on that day during that time. But we are also subjected to extreme forms of um, like violence brought about by the weather. So that's my very, very subjective um, description of what the weather is like in, in the Philippines. It can be extreme. And when, when you're living under a violent season, for example, they don't, they don't, um, last very long or so it may seem to people who are looking at it from the outside but actually you live you live with the consequences you live with the aftermath of it and you feel it every day but also you know when you are experiencing beautiful weather you're at the beach or you're hiking the mountains and the skies are blue it's easy to forget that you know it's the same place that has been devastated by all sorts of extreme weather conditions Luno means like a cataclysm and it's a, it's a cataclysm that's attached to or that's linked to water. Actually, the word came back to me during mm-hmm. Haiyan it, it, and I realized it's something that it, it's a word that I've always known, I've always heard. And, and, I, and I was talking to my, my siblings about how when I, I was growing up, I had recurring dreams of like swimming against very strong like, very black currents or waves of, of water. And I don't know where that came from. And, and I realized that that's my, my siblings said, yeah, we have the same recurring dream. And I guess it, it's part of our consciousness because although we grew up, you know, very privileged, very like safe, at the back of our minds, there was always that possibility that something like this could happen. And I guess because it was in the stories that we listened to, in, in, in the stories that, you know, were told to us. And, and so I thought about lunop and inop means dream. And linop means like um, dizziness, getting dizzy. So I, I just, I really like the sound of, of the words. And, you know, when I thought about it, they, they were kind of, I thought, related. I decided that, no, I, I want to include all of them. I want the noise mm. and I want to hear their voices and I want to hear the language and I know that you know people who don't speak or read what I will skip it that's fine I guess one of the messages that the book is trying to explore is how you know when when voices are drowned out you lose out on opportunities to you know to solve problems or when you don't listen to people who are most affected by you know, by climbing, for example, then, um, you know, you're not addressing the issue properly, I suppose. Stories can be a home for truths. Mm-hmm. And yeah, truths and, and, and knowledge that cannot be maybe accommodated by, you know, uh, other like forms of, of, of knowledge, like say policies or I don't know, science. And, and stories are important, especially local stories, because they contain local knowledge. They yeah. contain the language for, mm-hmm. you know, um, devastations and disasters. It's really also impacts people in, in different ways. I, you know, I, I, I keep 
um, saying this because um, people say that, for example, Haiyan, it was uh, an equalizing force. It wasn't. Of course, it, you know, it flattened the land, but it did not equalize things. It magnified inequality. So when you say, you know, I can gather all the news I need from the weather report, it also depends on, you know, your means. When I say, oh, I can hunker down and enjoy my cup of coffee because it's raining, that's probably not the experience of someone who lives, mm. you know, as a fisherman, let's say, as a, as a farmer. And I guess I, that's kind of what I wanted to say also in, in, in the novel, that the, the, the weather, the climate can affect people, different people in, in different ways. I'm thinking of, of the one who like emailed me recently and, and she said she was very surprised. Um, I mean, of, of course she knows me and, and she knew like what my family went through during the, 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 um, the typhoon and she read the news, but, but reading the novel, she said like, and, and I, I, I cautioned her against reading the novel right now because it, it's not, you know, it's not bright and cheery. <laughs> but but she said she was very surprised at how um, like deeply it affected people in, in different ways. So that's what she said, and and also um, she thought that it was very because um, I, I played with the sensory details and and especially olfactory, you know the the smell, which is hard, which hardly figures, I guess, in, in much of our literature but which well it affected me personally when, when I went there so she she didn't realize that because she said you know when you think about the Philippines you think about Boracay and Bohol and, and Palawan and, and she says nobody really talks about you know how fragile the the the, the climate is and, and the you know the the situation is like in, in the Philippines and she says of course it makes sense because you're made up of islands and you know and so on. but but she said it, it took the novel uh, for her to to start thinking about that